Hello, everybody, and welcome to This Week in X presented by Crushing Comics. We are assembled today, Faria, Harry, and myself, to talk about Marauders number 19. It was out on the 7th of April, 2021. And our This Week in X discussion always comes with a warning. This is going to be a spoiler-filled discussion. We're going to talk about all the details of this book, the history of these characters, and really just any old comic book thing that we feel like talking about. It could even be Green Lantern, as I discovered uh, from Harry a moment ago in, a, in another conversation. <laughs> so you never know where it's going to go, and this is a spoiler-filled <laughs> talk. To get started with Marauders 19, let's have a lightning round of our reactions, starting with Fariha. Um, this was, I don't know. So I, I've been liking Marauders a lot from the very beginning. It's a lot of fun and a lot of that. However, as it's kind of, I don't know whether it's winding down, whether, we, I don't know which direction it's going, but I am feeling like this is, this is like, talking about X-Men that was before Krakoan age. There was like the whole issue of that they're fighting kids and kids are manipulating new, what mutant status. And this goes back to the whole thing. It's like, oh, you can't come in because UN put a sanction. I'm like, really? UN put a sanction on Krakoa and Krakoa didn't have anything to say. <laughs> um, there are some character moments that are cool, that were funny. Uh, there was like Morlock showed up. Um, there are some other stuff, which is all cool. Everybody's talking about Gala, you guys, like Gala, Gala, Gala. And I really enjoyed the last page of the fashion thing. That was really good. So overall, I'll just give it somewhere at three, three out of five. All right. Harry, what did you think? This was wonderfully solid. Uh, I, I have feelings mostly like Fariha, but I feel like I liked it a little more. Um, a big reason is I just love Stefano Caselli so much. I think he's just an amazing artist. And so I'm reading this and I'm just like, this is such a pleasant, nice showcase of his art. It's such a base primal reaction where I just, I can't have a bad time reading it. Uh, but yeah, I, I do, this does feel like a book that's winding down, which I don't mean as a compliment. It feels mm -hmm. like a little bit of wheel spinning almost, which is uh, frustrating because you want these books to have momentum. I feel like some of these books have felt like they're just waiting for events like the gala or what have you, which is not what you want. And, um, but it's got some cool moments. It's got some really cool ice, uh, Bobby and uh, Pyro stuff. It's got really good stuff with a, a surprise feature ca featured cast. And um, Kitty Pride look, Kate Pride looks really good in this. She looks amazing. Um, all that said, though, I'm gonna give it 3.75 uh, fire and ices out of five. <laughs> The thing that really occurred to me it was was just art. Like I was just hit by the art, not only Caselli's art, who I, I really do like, but Edward Delgado on colors just, I think just went off on this issue. The color work is so great. And I love color work that's so good that I can get lost in the colors. So often colors are like serviceable, but here I was like, ooh, let's look at the colors, which is a fun feeling to have. I also am a easy mark for Morlocks. And so I really love the stuff that it was talking about with Morlocks here. It, it was pleasing. But the thing I would come back to in my initial reaction, and we'll get into all this that I think both of you hinted on is there's this idea of technical debt when you're in a tech organization, which is basically like it costs more to keep solving the old problem than to just wipe it from scratch and do a new thing. So just spend the time to do the new thing. And some of the stuff with like still trying to make the Hellfire kids relevant and still trying to address some of these Madripoor things that have been around for decades, it really feels like technical debt to me. Like we almost have something new and different. Why are we spending issues of time to on these plots, which are like very old antiquated plots in terms of what we could be doing, which I think the Morlocks plot represents to me what we could be doing. So I am sure these themes are gonna come out at least from me in this conversation, but that was my reaction. Didn't hate, didn't love, great art, maybe burdened with a little bit of depth. Okay, so let's get into this for a moment. And um, it's like your let's like time debt inversion. <laughs> is that what you're going right. with? Right. This is actually this is actually we're gonna pivot and this is gonna become a finance channel. That's why everything's about debt in these conversations. We're gonna just, just hit it, pivot and talk about cryptocurrency and all that stuff. Diversify your bonds. That's yeah. all I can say. Uh, <laughs> As much as it's tempting to kind of just go through this sequentially, I actually think the more interesting discussion might be to address this particular issue non-sequentially. 
And I, because I think the most important thing is something that doesn't come out until almost the end, which is the way the Morlocks are being used here. Now, I know you, you've read a lot of X-Men, but you haven't necessarily either of you read like the original Morlock stuff, you know, but I think you get at this point, they're ugly mutants. They lived in the sewer. They were massacred by Mr. Sinister's marauders. Like the, this is all taken as read at this point. So there's this really interesting situation that this issue reminds us of that the marauders uh, or I'm sorry, the Morlocks are not on Krakoa, largely. They're have, they have their own thing that they're doing. But Callisto pulled Mask into the Madripoor stuff by have him do his magical mutant operations on babies in the prior issue. And now that there's unrest in Madripoor and the X-Men are barred by international law or something from getting involved, Kate and Callisto come up with this plan that they're basically just going to backdoor the, the Morlocks into Madripoor and have them do the dirty work. And this, I almost missed, honestly, until the one of them was like, kill no man, huh? Well, I don't live on Krakoa, which really makes you realize that there are subcultures of mutants out there that actually don't subscribe to all this Krakoan stuff um, and are existing just fine. So I just am really interested for the two of you who maybe don't have quite as much background on Morlocks as I do. How did this subplot hit you? And how did you feel about Kate and Callisto really using the Morlocks without even fully explaining to them what they were getting into for you? So um, I think this that is the theme of this week's. Yes. Uh, both ex, both uh, Excalibur and for Marauders, it's like there are not like, you know, mutants are not monolith and then yes. they are not just going to just accept everything. Um, so we talked about it right before we started recording about like continuity, how there is so much continuity. But I just wanted to point out this is a good uh, example of continuity being used. I'm where so happy you feel that way. <laughs> Yeah, no, where it's like, I didn't know anything about it. I understood the context. I understood where they were coming from. I understood what the history between them are. It was all laid bare right there. And then it, was, it wasn't it was hindering at all. Um, but to that point though, it's like, you know, Callisto is like, she's part of the Morlocks, right? She used to be part she of- She was the, the leader. Or she- Yeah. She was yeah. the leader of Morlocks. But, but the thing is like, if you think about it, it's like, she's the prettiest one of them all. And so that's why she gets to still come to mutant and be well, part now, of the upper tier. Her whole thing now, used to be about how ugly she, she was. Right, That's like right. she gets to be other, but the, but then the thing is like others are like you know oh they're not, and then they are used as soldier for the Krakoa nation in a way, and they are not even told that they are being used. And as a matter of fact, they are actually used. Oh, these are they are monsters, so we are just going to use them as such. So in a way, like you know, we talked about that how these are like kind of thinking, like you know, uh, we talked about like the economic technical debt, like these are like older stories. But then there's also signs of like fourth generation writers of new age of Krakoa, like that are doing something that are interesting. Um, however, I feel like it's a lot of things that we are kind of talking about it because we want it. I personally want it to be true. Was this in the story? I'm not sure. Did that I make think sense? it was. I hear you okay. though. Like we sometimes see these themes and we're like, there's a difference between mm -hmm. seeing the theme in the book and the theme being intentional in the book. Some people would actually say there's not a difference. That's a whole different critical discussion. But before yeah, I dig sure. into that, let me tag okay. in Harry here. <laughs> I actually thought this worked really well. So I know the Morlocks. I don't remember from where, but I have read a, a few stories with them. So it Morlocks. might just be like some kind of, yeah, some kind of fugue state from way back when. Um, this worked great for me. I think it was this interesting, like it is one of the very, I think one of the few times we've seen like a entirely different faction operating outside of Krakow and totally being comfortable with that in their own way. Um, and like, it, it's a, it's a weird counterpoint to the scene, you know, in an earlier issue where, uh, the one Morlock was given this like great purpose and way of healing these children and what have you. And this is the way more ambiguous thing where they're being used in this way. And it gave it this kind of like, like a little bit of murkiness that I thought worked really well. Um, also not to be basic, but it looked really good. It just and so the, good. Vo the voices felt good. Like, I think it just had the right kind of energy. I, I think the scenes with the Morlocks were easily the best of this issue. Um, so yeah, two thumbs up. And, and then uh, to that point, like another thing we talked about is like ugly, there being the ugly mutant. I'm like, why is Beak not part of them? That's my thing. So, like, it's so, it's like, so incredibly arbitrary also. Not to like, that right, thing. like who's ugly and who's not. Yeah, also, Faria like, enjoying a story with ugly mutants. This is what we call No, gold. these are, no, because, but that's what I'm saying. 
like they're not ugly enough. They're not weak. Like you know, they're not. Like, they're they're just like very like, like rock you know, slide and glob Herman are not attractive creatures. They are they're creatures really. Let's they're like <laughs> golems and gelatinous. You know, like the guy's yeah, eyeballs so like, are popping out of his skull. Ver- versus <laughs> this one 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 lady, like you know, her she's like she's all fine. Then she opens opens her mouth and you're like, ah! <laughs> and I have to say, that? the thing then, I loved, I had to review that character, her name is Bliss, because I, I could not recollect her at all. So mm-hmm. I went and like did my wiki dive and she is, she specifically was made by Mask at one point to look like Jean Grey because I love on the big splash page, not really a splash, but it's a big panel of all of the Morlocks yeah. that she not only right. looks like Jean Grey, but she specifically is drawn like Walt Simonson draws Jean Grey. And I was like, oh, that's like a really good riff on Simonson drawing Jean Grey. <laughs> only then to read the wiki and be reminded, oh, she is literally Jean Grey from Walt Simonson drawing Jean Grey. <laughs> I just thought so- that was really cool. And yeah. no, and like given that you know all the history of Sinister and Morlocks and stuff like that, I know on a very separate level. I'm like, oh, don't tell me that's another clone. No, no. Like you know, <laughs> we, we are we are we going to have another one of those? Yeah, put her in the ground. Let's not bring her back. But I think that the other interest, not to get too deep into continuity world without Tyler to back me up because he's way better at this than me. But uh, Marrow is somebody I think you would really have interesting opinions on because Marrow is kind of like second or even third generation Morlock. And she basically comes up and is saying like, we're too satisfied to just be here in isolation, not doing anything. Like if, if we're really gonna have our own power and be our own society, we should be active. We shouldn't always be downtrodden. And that's in the like um, early 300s of Uncanny X-Men, it comes to a head in Uncanny X-Men 325 as she kind of leads a separatist group. And then she later joins the X-Men. So it's kind of this like constant cycle. Uh, and I think it's really funny because not funny, but like remarkable, interesting because It's a different dynamic now. It used to be the Morlocks would always say to the X-Men, like, protect us, protect us. And the X-Men would deign to protect them when they needed to. And then sometimes the Morlock would be like, stay out way, stay out of our business. And we've seen that too. But here's like a very specific situation where Krakoa is basically coming to them and saying like, we would like to use you which really exposes, I think, a lot of interesting things that are emerging about class. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one of the things that is becoming a theme here is that not all mutants are equal in this Krakoan society. There's the cool X-Men mutants, there's the pretty mutants, uh, and there, you know, there's the people who even got a resurrection, there's the clones, and here we have the Morlocks. Yeah. Yeah, who are not even told that how they're being deployed. That was, that was something. And you know what? A little bit of me, I'm like, yes, mutants, be evil to each other. <laughs> like, you know, be, <laughs> use each other to be evil. Don't like, you know, it just, I think, so that's one of the things, like, you know, it's just like a lot of the story beat points are very like old school. And I'm like, uh, but then, then you get to this point and you think, start thinking about it. Like, okay, at least those were interesting. Right. Like, you know, but um, something that Tyler made sure that, you know, wanted us to talk about though is like uh, the surgeon guy, I forgot his name. Mask. When he Mask. When he comes in uh, and he meets Kate in the sewer, that was their first meeting as well. So it's a, it's a copy paste of that. Like, yes. That's one of the he, so Kate back in the day was was kidnapped by the Morlocks. Calis, or Caliban was wanted to marry her, and then the X Men would go down to the sewer. It was a whole thing, and like Mask was one of the major named Morlocks even back then. So it's absolutely a, a mirror. T- Tyler sending us written instructions to make sure we yeah, talk Richard, about this. Yeah, like, he's, getting a, he's getting a nosebleed right now. He doesn't know why. He's just <laughs> like, someone's talking about this And stuff. it's like, oh, real <laughs> cute kitty. And then it's like, it's <laughs> yeah. you know? That was gross, by the way. Yeah, well, that's but, the other thing. I know Faria hates when mutants have to go through se- sewers. I, I didn't get why... Kate, like, being sick and throwing up was such a beat. Like, she was phased. Like, yeah, she went through the sewers, but then she came up. Like, I, I couldn't figure out if I was supposed to be getting something else from her throwing up all those okay. times. Okay! I was I, so I was so confused about why it was such a big plot point. Right, and I was actually, I'm like, did she have, did she have sex with someone? Like, you know, like, I, it's, I, it's I thought baby. that. I'm like, is she pregnant? Like, not that that's <laughs> the thing we should have to think oh, about the characters every time, but it just was so incongruous to what was happening that I could not figure out why it was important. Yeah, because it was there, there twice. And then yeah. I was like, whoa. I'm like, mm, where is Colossus? <laughs> not that she's with him anymore, but. <laughs> That'd be such a friggin' left, like a curveball. Like, hey, by the way, Kate's pregnant. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, no. So, Let's okay. Do now that we've talked it, so I think. 
consensus, if I can be fair, is the Morlock stuff works even for some of us as newer readers than, or older readers. And uh, it feels like an interesting next step in this Age of Krakoa story. Now let's talk about something that's maybe not as interesting of a next step, my, the technical yeah. debt that I mentioned. We still have these Hellfire clip kids. L let's just get it out there that this particular group doesn't like them. It's fine if you like them. Everybody likes the things that they like. Hold on. <laughs> oh, 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 maybe Harry's not willing Harry to sign on to Harry that statement. Them. Oh, Harry likes them? I like the Hellfire kids and Jason Aaron's Wolverine and the X-Men. This was the issue where I'm like, why did we bring them back? It's not even like I hate them in this. I'm just like, the feeling is See, off and they're not adding anything and it just doesn't land. We'll talk about that more because I think that's where I was steering. Talk about the difference as, as, a, like, as a liker of these awful characters. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about the difference well, about them landing for you in Wolverine and the X-Men and not landing for you here. So I read Wolverine and the X-Men. It was one of my first X-Men runs. It still remains one of my favorites. Peter just had a stroke. He doesn't know why. Um, actually, yes, he does. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I had nothing to compare it to. I'm not comparing this group compared to the old Hellfire Club, who I know are a bunch of like leather daddy loving rich people. Like, But Ooh. like, <laughs> I wasn't here to, yeah. So they worked during Wolverine and the X-Men because that's a very cartoony, whacked out book and they were the right energy. They're a bunch of crazy kids with jetpacks and guns and one of them's a Frankenstein guy and a girl's like, you know, crazy. And like, it was like my fair part of that book, but it worked. It worked for that bonkers energy they were doing. And then you have it in this book and they've gotten a little bit older and they're more like, they're being played more straight because this is a more straight book than Wolverine and the X-Men. Most books are. And it just doesn't feel right because what made them fun was how cartoony they are when you try to make it more of a grounded thing that's dealing with economic policies and sanctions and, and, and what have you. It just it, it, it just feels like you're taking away the only thing that made them enjoyable. Like like the, there's a conversation that's between Bishop and the the, the Frankenstein. One yeah, of I don't, Victor Frankenstein. Yeah, he's the Frankenstein kid. I know I remember this, but like you don't get any of the fun of this kid who's like literally a descendant of Victor Frankenstein, if I remember correctly. He's just like one of the mm -hmm. guys and like it's just it's just kind of like just kind of there um so i didn't like it very much <laughs> well i think you i want to turn it over to freya but i want to pull out a specific point there which is that i don't know that i hated them just because i hate fun or whatever although i do oh, yeah. Yeah. but the i think the thing the thing is that it's this that tonal nice. whiplash right because they were introduced in in schism as, as this threat that was so yeah. major to the X-Men that it was gonna cause a crack down the middle of the X-Men. And I never understood that. But then you see them in Jason Aaron's run and it's like, oh, they're just made so that he can write a kid's book that's not just about grownups murdering kids all the time. And it's like, and and but he like set them up to be evil enough that they had weight as a villain. And over time, even though I didn't like them, I came to appreciate that he was like playing a rhetorical game there with making them big enough to be threatening, but then having them be kids so that he would have a villain for Wolverine and the X-Men. But now we have them facing off against the Marauders and it feels incongruous again to me. Freya, what did you want to talk about here? Uh, I mean, that's, it's just, I kept saying that. It's like, this is like the writing X-Men before Hawksbox. Like, it, this is a perfect story for X-Men before Hawksbox. Like, okay, yeah, because they are so downtrodden because my God, like, you know, I hate, okay. Can I just, I just want to put the disclaimer. I hate that, I, like, you know, that people keep on like, it was like, oh, okay, just take them as a fictional characters, you know, but I am a visible minority. So I, and they are considered to be a visible minority. So I cannot just take that as, as a face value. And the thing is, I want to forget that, but the thing is the comics don't let me forget that right, because they exactly. keep on reminding me again and again, oh, they're feared and hated and they have to save the world that fears and hates that. So, okay, so you tell, give me all of that. So I have to kind of take it from that point of view. And then it worked at that time. Like, okay, fine, they're not organized. They have no vision for the future because Cyclops is their dumb leader. And so it, none of that worked. And at that time, these were perfectly good villains for them. But now they're in a playing in a complete different level. They are a nation now. And are you telling me that one of these kids could go to UN and shut them down and they as a nation could not fight back and they had to fight in the sewer? Like, you know, with their, with their, like, you know, their Delta team, like, what is this? And I just like, I just hate that. I want the children of the vault to be here. They are more formidable. They're formidable villains. 
Why are these? So I, I understand why Duggan want to have a an Econo an economic force or foe in this book, considering all the global trade kind of subplots and, and just ramifications in this book makes total sense. And I get why you would want to bring in some continuity and get the Hellfire kids in and have some sense of transition, even if that might feel like we're just doing old stuff, as you guys have mentioned. But somehow, despite Duggan being very good at, at goofy writing and being able to tap into that, he just doesn't do it here. And they don't come off like a threat. They don't come off like a lot of fun. You're left with a, with a whole lot of nothing, which is super disappointing. Um, and yeah, this, this just wasn't the right pick. And not to mention that there's an old, like, you know, I, I forgot, like, I think she was from China, like old Chinese lady who was hanging out with them. And that just feels so weird i mean <laughs> everything Actually, about that <laughs> everything about that feels weird so well, she's mad <laughs> i don't know i don't know whether because dugan wants to make the heroes to be funny and everything so he can't make the villains to be funny as well you can i don't do know both you yeah, can that's I don't, true. But they're not but they're not funny that's the thing <laughs> But I do, I do, I do like the idea of like, okay, this given that this is all about trades and everything, you have uh, villains that are connected to finance. I do like yeah. that idea, though. Right, that yeah. part works for me. It's just, it's just, it's just, I, I'm not here to just hate anything just because I hate it. I'm never opening comic book just to like write it off because of certain characters there. But like, make it work. Plenty of these yeah. Age of Krakoa writers have taken something that I don't actually enjoy and made it work. We're nanny fans on this on this show, okay? <laughs> fans of nanny. Uh, anybody can make anything work. You got to make it work. So here's the third chunk of this non-continuity run through this issue. We've talked about the Hellfire Club. We've talked about Morlocks. I want to talk about Madripoor for a moment. Madripoor... Um, we almost, almost get a moment here where we actually get to think about the people of Madripoor for a change. It's so often used as this anonymous Asian country staging ground for Marvel nonsense. And you don't even get a sense that like anybody lives there. Like the only people who live there are just criminal element. That's, that's all of Madripoor. <clears throat> and this is one of the first times that like, I feel like we're actually close to something where the people are like, you're just warring over our, our space, our lives, our bodies, not just the Vrendi Corporation, not just the criminals that were here to begin with, but now the X-Men, the Morlocks, like it's it's fine that you came and saved us in this instance, but then are you just gonna leave us afterwards? And it's like, I can't decide if I fall more on the continuity as technical debt side of the equation where we were with the Hellfire Club, or if I fall more on the, this is good new material, like the Morlock side. So I'm really interested to hear where the two of you come down because I'm, I really don't know which way to feel yet. So this is a lot, what was happening to them was a lot like what was happening to mutants before. You know, like it just yeah. felt like, they, it, it was like, okay, now they're a little bit on the top, higher side than, you know, than the humans, like, you know, more downtrodden humans. Right. But the thing is, are they doing enough to help them or are they just go reverting back to however they were treated and then just bing bang boom come here trash the place and then right. just go so once again there is like a that element is there that thematically that can be explored is it being explored or are we just it, this is it this is all we're gonna right. get i get the sinking feeling this is all we're gonna get um, but I still kind of liked, I don't know. I mean, I don't have half the relationship with Madripoor that y'all do, but like, it I don't felt have like any Madripoor. Black Widow <laughs> okay. has more, right. Black Widow has more, more. Yeah, yeah. My relation to, to, uh, to me is that I find it, it puts me to sleep. I like this more No, it's than, extremely um, racist. It's and extremely, extremely racist. racist. Because the more and more I read it, yeah. the more, yeah. Just like evil yeah. Asian country. <laughs> Like, oh, oh yeah i mean to be honest yeah. shot for shot bangladesh but hey still racist you guys <laughs> so, <laughs> i can say it but it can be based I, in reality and also still racist i think the morlock stuff's cool i actually land on i think it's like a nice progression of continuity it doesn't feel like it doesn't feel as like old hat to me as it does to maybe y'all but um i'm not here like doing backflips about it it, it just was more <laughs> serviceable i don't know well, yeah. and here's, you know, 
I always try to read things with an open mind. And part of that is kind of learning to see the themes I didn't see before. And I think before we did our Hicksman report on Hawks and, and Pox, I didn't really think about colonialism in comic books that much. It just wasn't a thing to me. But at that time, you know, I'd been living in New Zealand for a few years at that point and learning about the colonialist history of New Zealand. And I was also reading books like The Savage Shores and Little Bird. And it, it opened up my awareness to be able to see that in comics, sometimes unintentionally, right? Sometimes it's like a white writer from a colonizer country who is just writing a plot that everybody can see, like this is colonizing. But to them, it's just this like fun plot. And so I think that's why like I'm having a different reaction to Madripoor that I used to. Like the X-Men are, are doing this thing where they provide limited aid, but then they just want to pull away the scaffolding real quick, you know, which is a very, it's a move that's been pulled on many, many countries around the world. And it's been made very literal here and that they literally built a hospital. Like you all must need a hospital. We're we're the, the rich privileged po folks. We'll drop by and make you a hospital now. named after one of our national heroes. Although they now. don't know that yet. Uh, but and, and they come because Callisto has led them to believe that the hospital is what, to, what they want to tear down. But it actually turns out that this hospital, which is the, you know, has been colonized right onto this uh, island, even though it was meant as a good thing, is the one thing that's not in danger. Not these people, not their neighborhood, not the livelihoods, but this thing that this other multinational force put on the island. So I, I don't have all the tools to, to assess that critically, personally, but I'm trying to learn them. And I think that that's why it came off so strange to me. It felt like we almost got the perspective of the people on the ground. But then at the end, it turned into like, so you want to run a bar? Like it's, it came off really surface level to me by the end of the issue. I don't know. Somebody save me from myself here. <laughs> no, I mean, you're, you're hundred percent right. And that's, it just like, it feels like it's there, but then it's not there anymore. And then, and, and if then another thing I just thought about, if like, if more marauders are not doing this kind of stories, what other stories they can be doing. I, I don't know, what's, their, what's the mission statement anymore? Right, it does, doesn't it feel like we've really, like at some point it was about drugs, but isn't that kind of the point? Like it was about exporting their culture in the form of a product and that product being something that could help people that they would either withhold or supply. And it actually turns out that that whole story is a story about this thing that's happening here. When you try to withhold or supply something in a, in a capricious way like that to benefit some and punish others, this is the result. Like, is, is that really what this whole story has been? Whether Duggan, again, intention sometimes doesn't matter whether Duggan intended it or not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't I don't know that you know but two things we I did wanted to talk about before we kind of go away from this um, is like <laughs> at the very end Bishop what do we feel about all of that like did it like in this issue or yeah like you know he just blew himself up that's, that's he didn't blow his... himself up I don't think he, he blew himself yeah. up yeah he I was just... there he didn't hide he didn't run away yeah he did I think he left yeah. You he think left. he? You think he, he stayed out. in the building? Well, because yeah. we know. But here's the thing: we know he didn't intentionally kill move. the kid because that is murder no man. So if the kid yeah. had enough time to get out, I assume that Bishop had enough time to jump oh, out a window okay. or then, something. Okay, I then that's why you think that's cool. I totally understand. Yeah, no, rereading. No, because the thing is, I'm like because. Yeah, he does not leave. That's what I'm saying. So I'm, I'm thinking that you know, maybe he just wanted to remove the M, and this was his way of getting that done. Like, I don't know, because I'm like, oh, okay. So that was like kind of badass, but kind of suicidal. Like, you know, it's like, okay, that was also a little bit unnecessary. So I don't know. I mean, I was just a little, you know, but the other one that was a little better is that the pyro, um, pyro, right? His name, yeah. the guy with the, with the pyro, like his conversation with, um, with Iceman over here is about like, you know, the, the whole how he felt like yeah. you know how he's like this is like a redemption for him it feels like the team is doing working for him and stuff like that i thought that that theme, theme kind of ran into excalibur in a lot of the ways and then you got to kind of see how fractions of like you know mutants who were not necessarily in that weird school where they were just all there and doing god knows what learned nothing did nothing just was in the school how life varies from that you know right like when you I are think, a mutant yeah they and then and then the thing is like so there is like how different people are reacting to it 
I really want more about this. Like, I want a series about this. Like, you know, how mutants are reacting to Krakoa, who are not X-Men. Maybe it's because uh, we're so close to the Hellfire Gala, and it's very clearly kind of seems like a dug-in uh, event, more, you know, mini event more than anything. But like, I just don't know if we're ever going to get that stuff. This seems like a book that's slowing down and not in a good way. And it doesn't I, have to be just here. Yeah. It could yeah, be yeah, everywhere across just, the I, board. Yeah. yeah, I'm just talking. I'm just rambling. But like, it just it feels like we're getting done with this and that kind of bums me out because I feel like we this arc's been odd you know mm. well let me hmm. let me uh throw out a final topic on this issue that there is the gala running beneath this a little bit because we know that it's coming and we know that even though it's more explicit in Excalibur which we'll get to talking about separately um it kind of looms here because it's the Hellfire's gala and and it's Emma Frost's kind of mission and while she's getting ready for a big party, she's also kind of fighting this turf war. And clearly it's going to come to a head. We've seen that the kids got invited and it's kind of like, they're, they're just going to walk into the gal and be like, hey, you just tried to blow me up. You know, like they're, they're, <laughs> Kate and crew are specifically antagonizing them knowing that next month they are going to have to sit down and have dinner with them. It's, and it's not like they're going to kill them. So they know they're going to show live. up. <laughs> Well, unless the Morlocks the kill them on their behalf, right? That's true. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because the thing is that Morlocks doesn't have to abide by the rule. I'm like, what is this? <laughs> it's a cool thing, cool concept though, but it's still at the same time, like, oh. Um, it was... Well, and one thing we haven't contended with yet, because it just hasn't, we haven't tested that rule too much, is what happens if there's somebody who is in Krakoan society who breaks the rule and then basically extradites themselves, right? Like, what if Sabretooth had been like, screw y'all, I'm leaving, so take your hole and shove it up your hole, you know? Like, what? <laughs> Drag them back. What, what, are, like, are they going to then start dragging mutants in? And like, what, what does that mean about Krakoa kind of appointing itself the mutant police for well, people who don't really, even want to be part of its society? That's very specific, and that is a, it sounds like a current citizen who then uh, right. uh, for, forgoes citizenship and then leaves. That's more like, you can almost view that as ownership, which that's a whole other thing. But like, you can see that making some kind of sense. It's not, it's different if it's like the Morlocks and they just stormtrooper kick down the doors or what have you. <laughs> uh, that's a, a darker card, thing. As a card carrying member of Brotherhood, I say that's a traitor. Kill them. <laughs> Kill them. <all>. Kill them. <laughs> but yeah. you know, we know that Moira really doesn't like Sabretooth, right? Like, we just know no. it. Moira no. really doesn't like Sabretooth. <laughs> like, if you see, oh, anyway, we'll talk about it another time. But yeah, mm -hmm. that guy had never had a future in this era. Um, <laughs> and then also, like, last thing we do, we should talk about the, the last data capture data page. Um, Tyler reminded me, asked, Tyler asked me to ask Peter if you remember the fashion magazine, not fashion magazine, but the swimsuit edition of X-Men that well, came out in 90s. Oh, yeah. I mean, I recall them. We oh, talked about, we, we, our conversation always seems to go there when I went on an Omar, Armour channel talking about your <laughs> condition. Somehow it always it turns out to be about the swimsuit issue. <laughs> Okay, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so she was talking like, you know, is there a low key uh, solicit is like, oh, by Christmas, we're gonna get a fashion magazine of the gala. I was, I I was that, like, that? Yes. fingers crossed. Yes. Like, let's yes. get all stellar artists, get some of these people from Twitter who like, you know, people love, uh, get some of these people like Kevin Wada and just do a pinup book of please. That's money on the table. You want it. And just like, do long form articles, have people have people have interesting things to say, you know, just write like, uh, we all want it. Every one of us bring, will buy it. Just, bring, and then get K Kieran Gillen to edit that. He done it for a while. He, did, he done it for yeah. Dev. So, <laughs> you're describing like, that thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the thing is the last thing that I took, oh, it took my breath away. Like, you know, when I, when I saw that, actually. The last thing this uh, this fashion uh, editor person or the writing person is saying, I'll be attending the Hellfire Gala with the rest of you watching from home in our sweatpants. I wasn't born a mutant, c'est la vie. It's like, wow, wow, you mofo. Like, it's like, I, I was not born a mutant as being something as a jealousy. Do you yeah. know how that sound? Like wow. how terrible that sound? Like. It took my breath away. <laughs> it's it's functioning in in two different ways, right? Because the Hellfire Gala on one side is the Met Gala, and it's like it's like saying I wasn't born 
famous say love you yeah. when you see like a kardashian at the met gala and you're like why are they there you know like yeah, right. but but then on the other side again the mutant books and this whole conversation is about the the intersection now of mutants and and class right so that's a class question like oh i would never be the kind of person invited to the hell, to the met gala to the hellfire gala but now we're intersecting that with an identity thing and it's creating really strange moments like a reporter on the x you know on the fashion desk being like oh if only I was born a mutant I could go to this party which is really an interesting question about appropriation which takes us back around the children of the atom like are there people that find being a mutant to be attractive now but do they just want the attractive parts of being a mutant without any of the parts of being of what it really means to be a minority in this I, I mean obviously yeah yeah <laughs> like I mean just... the answer is yes it was yeah you know, the answer is right. yeah <laughs> That's, what, that's yeah. what I'm saying. Like, I wish, like, you know, it's not that she was saying, uh, like, it's a she, right? Emma Newcomer. Emma Newcomer. Is, clearly yeah, a pseudonym. A, yeah. <laughs> Who is it really? <laughs> Harry. Yeah. <laughs> Peter Someone Parker. Harry. Uh, yeah. No, but the thing is, it's, like, it's not even like, oh, I wasn't born like a rich person, right? Or I wasn't born someone famous. Like, I wasn't born mutant. Like, I don't know. It just, it took, like, I was like, whoa. Like it's a, it was a lot. I'm like, well, is that that's the age of Krakoa we're living in? Right. That people in Marvel universe are saying that thing. Yeah, but also multiple men helping Jumbo Carnation. I love it. To, <laughs> to make, to make, and then cuckoos are there. They're that's all such like a cool judging. idea too. Yeah. Uh, lo- so uh, this is they just have their own five now. That's like the fashion five, <laughs> right? So I love it. I love that. Mutant technology, synergy. <laughs> yeah, this is what I want to see in X-Corp. I want to see at some point Madrox make five copies of himself to do something and just say, I call them the five, like totally straight face. <laughs> that's all I want. Uh, <laughs> Okay, well, that's been our discussion on Marauders issue number 19. Not so much of a sequential discussion of the plot, but clearly a lot of bigger issues here than just the plot. And when you put them together, you see where this book is heading plot-wise maybe as well. If you're looking for a discussion of Excalibur, you just need to look elsewhere on this channel because we talk about every X-Men book every week. And why do we do that, Faria? X-Men is better when it's read together. That's right. And I certainly had so much fun getting to dig into this with the two of you. So on the behalf of myself, Freya and Harry, thank you so much for watching and being a part of this week in X. And we look forward to talking to you again sometime soon. Until then, be well. Bye.